Aloha and good morning. Welcome everyone to Atlas Insurance Agency's webinar series presented by our AOAO specialty group. I'm your host, Sean Satterfield, Business Development Director with Atlas Insurance. Atlas is the largest insurance agency in Hawaii, providing risk management and insurance services to Hawaii clients since 1929. Atlas has recently received the honorable distinction of being the only Hawaii-based company ranking in the top 100 independent property and casualty agencies in the United States. From our last webinar, we will continue to be challenged with a hardened market, and as a result, a rise in premiums. In a few moments, we will explore how our experts are handling the hardening AOA market. Before we hear from our speakers, please allow me to go over a few housekeeping rules. You're gonna be in listen mode only, and we will do our best to address all questions that are submitted at the end of our presentation based on the timing that we have remaining. So please submit your questions through the Q&A window, and you can start submitting questions at any point during the presentation. Now we have an exciting agenda ahead of us, starting with insights from the global marketplace and how this ripple effect impacts Hawaii. Then we will hear about the challenging umbrella market. And we will also provide answers to why we, we are hardening and along with the state of the DNO markets. And then finally, we'll discuss proactive strategies on how Atlas can be your guide. At the end of the presentation, we will, we will conclude with uh, our, our Q and A's. Up first, uh, our two speakers are with the CRC group. CRC insures over 284,000 properties that cover 237 markets and place over 1.4 billion in real estate premium. Heather Dugan is a senior vice president with extensive knowledge in ca catastrophe modeling and underwriting for property insurance risks, including earthquake, flood, hurricane, and wildfire. Jim Sipich is a seasoned veteran with over 30 years of industry experience. And Jim is a senior vice president with the CRC group. And he's also the leader of the West Coast property placement team. Thank you, Heather and Jim for joining us today. Please share your thoughts on the global hardening property markets. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I guess first step in understanding or protecting ourselves from the hard market is is uh, acknowledging that we're we're facing a hard market, and uh, it's really uh, appreciate that you guys are getting us out in front of your clients and and keeping them up to date on what's happening. It's it's a super important topic topic. It uh, affects everyone's uh, uh, pocketbooks and will continue. Um, just give me a nod if you can hear me okay, if everything sounds good. Yep, sounds good so far. Oh, good. Um, you know, uh, it, the, I'm speaking to, to property insurance, uh, Heather and I are, and uh, it is a global marketplace, uh, the property insurance market, meaning, you know, there's, there is a finite amount of insurance capacity in the world and it all rolls up to a lot of the same places, be it reinsurance or Lloyd's of London. Uh, you got to keep in mind that when you see things on the evening news, uh, hailstorms and tornadoes and wildfires in Australia or um, a, a volcano eruption in the Caribbean, everything boils up to the same places and we're all sharing uh, in, in those events. And this is all going to tr trickle down to impact us. Uh, at this moment, you know, carriers are just under a lot of pressure. There's been a lot of activity. Um, there's, there pressure, there's pressure to improve rates, uh, reduce their, their limits, better manage their exposures, particularly to natural catastrophe risk. Uh, they're just facing a lot more scrutiny. Um, it started about three years ago. Uh, uh, on the faint, on the mainland, it works its way uh, west. I think we've probably been experiencing it for a while here on in Hawaii to various degrees, depending on uh, who your carrier is. But uh, certainly, you could be, if you haven't faced an, a rate increase yet, you you will be, and you most likely will be getting us another round of rate increase. Uh, it is on the uh, the radar screens of the carriers. Hawaii is getting more attention. Than it used to be. 
I've been told by industry veterans who have been around for 30 plus years that this is the toughest and the longest hard market that they have ever seen. And now that we're in the third consecutive year, we're definitely gonna to start to see this impacting Hawaii. Next slide. So there, there are lots of elements to, uh, to a hard market, but certainly uh, losses are a big part of it. Uh, this data here uh, provided by Munich Re, one of the largest reinsurers in the, in the world. Uh, just to summarize, uh, 40 billion per year on average of insured natural catastrophe losses for the period 1980 to 2016. You know, that's carriers are managing around that, those kind of numbers. Suddenly, 2017, we take off with Hurricane Harvey, Irma, Maria, um, a huge event. There's California wildfires in that year. There's some, uh, some other big hail losses. Uh, and those are just the US uh, portions. It continues for, for since then uh, to be above average. We're averaging for, for four years about 90 billion in losses per year. Uh, that's what it boils down to. Right? Uh, certainly we're, we're a little bit worried about 2021 uh, and we've already kicked off the year with uh, some with a bad event in Texas. Uh, just for some perspective on that, her, the winter storm, URI, as it's called, is actually estimated insured losses between 10 and 20 billion, which is really significant that that's happening already in you know, Q1 of 2021, because the first quarter really doesn't have that significant of losses generally. Next slide. Hawaii in the news, um, you know, prior to five years ago, the only event our carriers and underwriters could point to that ever, you know, that they could remember impacting Hawaii was uh, Iniki, and that was in 1992. So in the last five years, of course, um, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of regular events showing up, lava flows, rain that's causing flooding and not only localized on one island, but on all islands, uh, hurricanes and tsunamis. Hawaii has long been recognized and respected by our carriers for taking care of each other and your properties. And losses have generally been infrequent and low. Unfortunately, that's changing. Um, in the eyes of our London and European partners, especially, they, they tend to see these headlines. That's why we kind of call it in the news because they see these headlines and by the time it gets to them, it seems to be a little bit over sensationalized. So we spend a lot of time, uh, more and more time talking to them about the events that are happening or that are near misses and how it's localized and not you know, happening to every single island or the whole state. Next slide. We thought it would be important to distinguish between uh, what is the admitted marketplace standard carriers or, and the non-admitted marketplace. The, excess and surplus lines market where that's really where the market that Heather and I deal with primarily. Um, you know, if we went back to the, the, the winter storm URI example, um, Houston, where, that, where they had so many problems is, does not have a very viable standard market like Hawaii does. You guys are, you guys are fortunate that you have standard carriers that are able to do large limits, a hundred million on a single policy to do lower deductibles in respect to hurricane, to do blanket limits in many cases, to do, to do all that without surplus lines tax. Um, it's a limited market, but you're lucky to have it for, for, for what is a, 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 a nat cat natural catastrophe exposed area. Uh, conversely, if, if you were to be in the non-admitted market for that same $100 million risk, these excess and surplus carriers are managing their underwriting by limiting capacity. Uh, it might take five or seven, or maybe in this market, eight markets to put together 100 million in limits. And you can, of course, that's gonna cost uh, additional, you know, more money. Uh, 
I, I think we're also seeing in a difference in the sort of rate increases you might see in the admitted market versus the excess and surplus lines market. Uh, Ron Sukumaki will speak to the standard markets, but on a non-admitted basis, uh, really a 10, 15% increase is the starting point for the best case scenario. Uh, and I, I think it's also worth pointing out that something that were to move from the admitted to the non-admitted market would uh, easily be a 30, 40, 50% increase in rate. So uh, the lesson that we've learned in all the transactions that we handle on a day-to-day -day basis is in this market, value your incumbent carrier. Whoever has your insurance now is more than likely going to be the best, the best solution for you. Um, if those, those accounts where you're forced to move are really uh, the ones that have uh, the bigger increases in, in, in premium. Sean. Okay. Hey, Jim, if you could just speak a little bit louder in your mic. You got it. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. So to Jim's point, um, even if your risk is going to stay with your incumbent, and hopefully it will, um, if your risk is staying with your incumbent, they're still re-underwriting everything, whether it be admitted or not admitted. And especially if your risk is going to, you think it might move from the admitted side to the ENS or non-admitted side, we can't stress enough how important it is to put together a really, really well thought out submission. Our underwriters have, you know, a thousand times more submissions than they had a year ago, and they are only going to look at, you know, the best of the best. So um, if you can tell your story, in detail, that's that's going to go a long way. We we recommend that you start early, you know, months in advance. Start talking to your agent about how to put together the best story, what information to pull together. Uh, provide detailed information, which I mean, so everything that you're going to provide, if there's story to it, you know, put that in there. Um, that helps your agent and us as your ENS brokers to talk through it with the carriers and, and explain what's going on with the risk. COPE is the term that our underwriters use to describe the details of the risk. So construction, occupancy, protection, and exposure. Uh, for the protection specifically, because that can be kind of an open-ended thing, is please share all of the details. If you have sprinklers, fire extinguishers, tell all of that. Additionally, what is the regular maintenance of these items? You know, what's your plan? What, what are you doing on a regular basis? I think sometimes that stuff that you just do without thinking is, is forgotten. So include all of that detail in your story. Uh, invite your agent out to visit your property. Allow your agent to see for themselves firsthand what the property is so that they can then in turn help tell your story and, and bring up more talking points perhaps that you might not have thought of to help with the placement. If you do have loss activity, um, then you know not only what was the loss, because that's of course important, but what have you done to repair the damage and then further to mitigate that from possibly happening again in the future. Uh, thinking through that process and sharing that uh, with your agent so that we can share it is, that goes a long ways so that your carriers know that you care about the property and, and wanna make it change. Um, and then valuation. Yeah, on, on valuation, Sean, we can go to the next slide. Uh, accurate valuation of your property is, it's, it's important to your carriers. It should, you know, it's very important to you as well to get the, uh, make sure that you have the limits that you need when your loss happens. Uh, take a look at your values. Hopefully they're, they, they bear some resemblance to current modern reconstruction costs in Hawaii, we all know that uh, it's gone up a lot uh, just due to an, an inflation. Your underwriters are gonna be looking at, at that and evaluating that as well. Uh, yes, your rate, your premium is a, is a, a rate against that value and there's, a, there's always a temptation to reduce the value, reduce the premium, but we need to do everything we can to keep these uh, these your your risk on the under on the top of the underwriter's desk and anything suspect like that and it's going to cause us problems. Uh, to to incorporate into your accurate replacement cost, you want to consider unique construction. You know, perhaps a, a, a an 
atrium with koa wood or whatever the case might be, you know, unique finishings, uh, anything with historical value that's difficult to replace. Uh, also, you want to make sure that you add a significant amount for the operation of building laws. So much of the property in Hawaii is uh, is getting dated, frankly, and, and there are a lot of areas where uh, building laws are going to drive your, your uh, loss costs higher. And finally, and probably most importantly, in my mind, uh, demand surge. Uh, certainly here in, in California, we had some specific experience. We see it actually all the time in dealing with natural catastrophe insurance, but uh, following the California wildfires, it was weekly news headlines that uh, nobody had enough limits. Uh, everybody had underreported their, their insurance. Everybody was unhappy with their, with their claims. Um, and simply that it boils down to the lack of materials, the cost of materials following a big event, the, uh, the lack of good, uh, labor in the area. And you can only imagine how that would be uh, multiplied in the islands. Um, just transportation difficulties, or even further uh, uh, complicated by something like COVID, which is already impacting uh, the availability of materials and so forth. So yeah, do what you can to help us keep your account on the top of the underwriter stack. I think Ron will get into that in, in more detail next. Okay, thank you, Heather and Jim. Now with understanding of how the markets are affected globally, you know, we're gonna to turn to our local uh, representative Ron Tsukumaki to discuss the Hawaii marketplace. Ron is a consultant with Atlas Insurance AOEO Specialty Group. He has led the unit since 2007 and brings over four decades of experience. He works with a, our AOEO group to manage over 300 condos and HOAs throughout the, throughout the state of Hawaii. Ron, can you give us an idea of how the local property market landscape is and how the carrier's appetites have changed? Uh, thanks, John. Uh, Jim mentioned, and I think Heather mentioned, that uh, some people have gone through, uh, especially some people who've been in the business a long time, uh, several market cycles. Well, I qualify for that. I've gone through three major market cycles in my career of over 40 years. Anyway, uh, during those three, uh, a couple things uh, really show up. Uh, number one, you have a withdrawal of certain markets. They just don't want to write in that uh, either the area, the location, or they don't want to write the kinds of business in that area. Uh, well, this market cycle, we're seeing a tremendous withdrawal within the property market, but we're also seeing problems in other lines. And we'll be talking about those, I think, in the umbrella lines and the DNO lines of markets that are uh, either restricting coverage or withdrawing completely from the marketplace. But let's talk a little bit about property. Uh, in the property marketplace, we really have a limited selection of markets. Uh, Jim talked about the fact that, yeah, Hawaii has had a, a certain uh, availability of what we call uh, admitted markets. They're not uh, excess and surplus lines, they're admitted markets. And one of the big differences, if they're admitted market, they have to file their rates with the insurance department, their forms and their uh, terms and conditions with the insurance department who approve those rates. And then if things change, they have to either withdraw or refile for new rates and getting higher rates out of the insurance department can be difficult. But let's talk a little bit about I'm going to break it into two different kinds. One is the fire resistive marketplace. Uh, those are usually for the high rise, fire resistive buildings. Um, there's three major standard markets. First insurance, who has been the largest writer of uh, 
fire resistive high rise buildings in the state at one time. Fireman's Fund, uh, another carrier that's been around a long time. Recently, Fireman's Fund was purchased by Allianz, who happens to be one of the world, world's largest uh, carriers out of uh, Germany, but they're still Fireman's Fund anyway, and they're very large. And then the third, uh, DB Insurance, and DB is fairly recent. They uh, came to Hawaii in 2006, but they've really established themselves and have grown tremendously over the years and write a lot of the business in Hawaii. The second group I would say is we considered the wood frame uh, Mason rejoiced it. Uh, there's frame in the roof for, with the masonry wall. So those markets are Lexington. And by the way, Lexington is technically a excess and surplus lines market. Uh, in fact, we go to CRC and access Lexington, but uh, they have had a program in Hawaii for several years. And so I sort of consider them one of the more standard programs because they've been here writing uh, wood frame masonry joist business. The other uh, is Lloyd's of London, another excess and surplus lines marketplace. But there, uh, uh, another broker called RPS has a program with Lloyd's of London. And we also use that program a lot if you're a wood frame masonry joist program. And again, DB, who uh, also writes wood frame masonry joist. The reason first and Fireman's Fund don't write Mason rejoices. They were here in 1992 when Iniki hit and they suffered significant loss. So they just got out of writing wood frame business in Hawaii, basically. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about first. Uh, Jim mentioned capacity. At first, uh, before, uh, let's say before, 2018, uh, they first could put up a tremendous amount of capacity. We've seen them on $300 million buildings. Well, after they uh, had their loss, the big loss was in 2017 with the Marco Polo, uh, their capacity has significantly been reduced. Uh, they have re gone through re-underwriting their basic book of high rise fire resistant accounts. And uh, when I say re underwriting, they're going, they sent people out to re inspect. And then they're looking at, uh, Heather mentioned COPE, construction, occupancy, protection, and exposure information. They went through that very thoroughly with the accounts that they had. And it really increased their rate significantly. Uh, so they have been uh, very conservative in their right business writing. Certainly, they don't like non-sprinklered buildings today, and they are not interested in writing older risks uh, prior to 1990, primarily because most of those risks are still non-sprinklered, but uh, those also, risks also tend to have a lot of water damage claims uh, just because of their age. Uh, next slide. Fireman's Fund Allianz. Uh, they, uh, Allianz is one of the largest uh, underwriters in the world and, and they purchase Fireman's Fund. So they have a tremendous amount of capacity still. Uh, they, uh, but they're very conservative and they will underwrite and look at your losses very carefully. And we have seen them significantly increase their deductibles. Uh, we've seen $50,000 deductibles. Uh, if you have water damage claims, they might have a $50,000 deductible. And certainly the rates have increased significantly. Uh, they tend not to want to write, uh, if you have a building, oceanfront building, they tend not to want to write those type of buildings. And we recently see them issuing uh, new checklists with a lot more questions about the risk, the protection, all the COPE information and uh, that type of information, especially regarding water damage claims. So 
they're getting a lot pickier and their rates have significantly increased. Next slide. Uh, I think you missed a slide there. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, next slide right there. Yep, DB. Yeah, My apologies. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, DB, uh, again, they're uh, another standard market. Uh, they have become really today uh, one of the more aggressive uh, underwriters. They, at one time, they uh, had limited their capacity to around 100 million. Now they're writing much bigger accounts. We have uh, seen them pick up accounts uh, over 300 million. So they have added a lot of capacity and are uh, aggressive. Uh, but uh, they are really under, starting to underwrite uh, against accounts that have adverse loss history. So, you know, they, even though they're aggressive and writing larger accounts, if you have an adverse loss history, uh, we're going to have to address that or DB might not be the market. Uh, they're certainly, uh, they've written a lot of business that are non sprinklered And so they're becoming much more selective with older accounts because they uh, see a lot more of the water damage claims with the older accounts. Uh, but they are certainly one of the most competitive markets today. Uh, and they, you know, and one of the things we're seeing, just like uh, Fireman's Fund, they're requiring uh, pretty extensive worksheets now to be completed. Next slide. Okay, Lexington. Uh, we talked that they have uh, a program here. Uh, it's basically ta tailored towards wood frame based rejoicing risk. Uh, again, they, like others, are becoming much more selective. Uh, if they have an older wood frame risk, they're asking a lot more questions about the plumbing because uh, water damage claims uh, as your pipes age, they rust, they corrode, and they're having a lot of problems. So they're, uh, they are starting to require inspections of those regular inspections by like a licensed plumber of all the high hazard plumbing elements. Uh, their rates are increasing as, as well as the deductibles. And uh, what we have found is that if uh, DB has been writing a risk, they tend not to want to compete against DB because DB has been very competitive in the past. Next slide. Uh, the Lloyds of London RPS program, historically they have been a little more conservative, uh, a lot of that has to be due to the fact that the Lloyd's syndicate uh, have had a lot of shrinking capacity because of global cat losses that the Lloyd's syndicate tends, those, they tend to be uh, writing a lot of that. So they uh, have been, uh, their capacity has significantly shrunk and they are probably the most selective of the three carriers uh, uh, and that I've mentioned in this category. And they haven't been quite as competitive in the past as Lexington or DB, but uh, they can be competitive. Next slide. Okay, so uh, Jim talked somewhat about some of the ramifications about being non-renewed. But if you're in the standard, basically those markets I talk about were what I consider semi-standard. If you're in those markets, uh, great. You want to stay in those markets because as Jim talked about, uh, you get uh, non-renewed and the other carriers in the standard market don't want you, then you go into what we call the excess and surplus lines market. And uh, I think Jim pretty much talked about what you're going to find a significant, huge increase in certainly the rate. And we've also seen big increases in the deductible and restrictions on terms and conditions. Their policies tend not to be nearly as broad as the standard market pro policies. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> If you have an adverse loss history, 
<clears throat> and you're going to be going to the excess surplus lines market. I think we're going to have to really work on a strategy on, uh, and Heather talked a little bit about it. What do you do? Next slide. So what do you do? Well, if you've had past losses, the key thing is you need to be upfront with the underwriters. Oh yeah, we've had these past losses, but here's what we've done to prevent future losses. I mean, okay, what's happened in the past, but underwriters aren't gonna wanna look at you unless they feel that you're doing something to fix. So they don't inherit your, pat, uh, your past losses. So another question you need to ask going out to the marketplace, do your, does your agent have access to all the competitive markets? Not all the agents have access to all the markets. And so you're really gonna wanna be sure with this limited marketplace to go with agents who have access to all the markets. And then uh, one of the things, uh, and Heather brought this also out, has anybody looked at your facility in the last few years or at any time? Uh, so one of the things, you know, she mentioned that is key. You have to tell your story. How do you get yourself to the top of the pile and stay there for underwriters who have hundreds of risks that they are looking at every day? You need to uh, tell a story. And the one thing I say is that, you know, uh, we as agents, our job is to make your clients look as good as possible. We don't want to lie and and put things in that aren't true. But we certainly want to highlight all the good things about your risks. I, I always say it's like taking your risk on a date. You know, we have to make your risk look as good as possible and tell the story as good as possible to the underwriters. And that's our job. And that's one of the things we certainly try to do best by certainly knowing our risks, uh, answering all the questions. Don't leave anything unanswered on the applications. You leave something unanswered, the underwriters will put in their own answer and it's usually not gonna be as good as yours. So we wanna be sure that the applications are very thorough and we explain the things about losses. So anyway, those I think to have the most successful renewals are some of the key things uh, that you're gonna need. All right. All right, thank you, Ron. Excellent job. Okay, now let's turn to the umbrella marketplace and what changes are on the horizon. With us today, we have Donna Percival and Lisa Rogers from Distinguished Programs, which is a specialty insurance carrier for umbrella coverages. Donna is the regional sales executive and has over 30 years of industry experience. Lisa Rogers is an account executive with also uh, 17 years of experience. And she specializes in commercial real estate, hospitality liability, and excess liability. Donna and Lisa will now share how to navigate the challenging umbrella market. Thanks, thank you, Sean. Um, good morning, everyone. First, Lisa and I would like to thank Atlas for inviting us to participate in today's webinar. Um, so what we're gonna be talking about today is the continuing challenges that we're having in the umbrella market um, by taking a look at what's happening in the marketplace and the outlook of it, market conditions by the carrier, and just a brief overview of how the pandemic has impacted the industry. Next slide. As the two previous, um, as previously mentioned, we are in our third year of a hard market. The two key areas that are contributing to the rising premiums in the umbrella industry are based on two factors. Number one is the carrier is changing their appetite and their underwriting guidelines, and also the loss experience is impacting the rates as of today. How carriers evaluated the risk today is much different from what they looked at, how they looked at it three years ago. 
By this, I mean they were taking a much more cons- they're taking a much more conservative approach on what they will write, resulting in their appetite shrinking. They are digging deeper and deeper into an account and looking closer at the risk than ever before. You might have personally experienced this by the number of questions that they're asking at time of renewal. Community associations in Hawaii are unique to other associations throughout the United States because of the high percentage of rental units. Carriers want to know more about the number of rental units to determine if it's truly a community association or a condo tell. There's a, the line between these two can be slightly blurred. They're also gonna be asking if the units are short-term or long-term rentals. They're gonna wanna know if the units are being rented by the individual owners or if the units are in a rental pool. And Lisa's gonna touch base on that in a few minutes. We've been seeing a 25 to 30% increase on umbrella rates with accounts without claims. If renewals have a large claim or a frequency, we've seen increases going over 100%. In addition to that, carriers are restricting coverages or adding exclusions to policies, and this is limiting your coverage. One of the common exclusions now on umbrellas is communicable diseases. Although the umbrella rates have increased, in some cases, you're losing your limit. For example, you may be paying the same or more at renewal, but your limit is now dropping from 25 to 10 million. Next slide. The other driving factor to the rise in premiums is loss experience. Let me share an example with you. Several years ago in Hawaii, there was a a high rise complex that had a fire. The fire started in a single unit, the stairwell doors, which act as a firewall, were left open, and the fire spread to the three floors quickly. Quickly, there were several fatalities and over a dozen seriously injured. Millions of dollars were paid by the umbrella carrier. Carriers are seeing an increasing number of severity losses, such as this one. They're also seeing deteriorating rate trends, and the cost to settle a claim is much higher now due to the rising cost of litigation broader contract interpretation of a policy, plaintiff and friendly legal decisions, and large jury awards. As you can see from the chart below, a medium cost for a single fatality in the early 2000s ranged between 1.7 and 2.4 million. The same claim in 2019 was over $5 million. Let me share another example of a claim for something like this. There was a woman who was walking around her condominium complex on a windy day. The branch split from a tree and killed her. An arborist had advised the association that the tree needed to be trimmed back and weak branches removed. The carrier paid $6 million on this loss. One of the other factors that's impacting claims is the social conscious public. Next slide. As you can see from this chart, in the second quarter of 2020, umbrella premiums increased by 20%. The other two lines of business that were impacted hard were property at a 13.3% and DNO at 16.8%. These lines of business continue to see increasing rises this year. Next slide. Additional impacts of the hardened market Our liability loss dollars for claim settlements over 5 million account for 20% of all loss dollars. This is substantially higher than we have seen in the past. Excess limits are now considered a working layer. Reinsurance carriers are pulling back and not willing to take on more risks. We're seeing more litigations being financed. This is when a third party funds the suit in exchange for receiving part of the settlement. Carriers who have written umbrellas in prior years are pulling out of the market, and those who remain in the excess markets are reducing capacity. Medical costs continue to rise, and as Donna mentioned earlier, juries are awarding more liberal verdicts, resulting in higher payouts by the carrier. Next slide. In underwriting review of the condominiums, underwriters are taking a very close look at the type of rentals, timeshares, condo tells, and if they're oceanfront versus non-oceanfront. Short-term rentals, there's two types. Unit owners renting direct and then placing into a rental pool. 
Unit owner rentals is when an individual unit owner uses a third party booking direct like an Airbnb. They are not advertised through any other booking agency like Expedia or booking.com. These type of individual rentals are harder to find coverage on as there is not a lot of control with the third party booking and the association has no control or contract in place for the risk transfer. Rental pools, which are preferred in insuring because they have more common controls in place. A rental pool is created by a group of owners who decide to pool or combine rental incomes from their units and share the expenditures. The owners will also share profit or loss from the rental pool. The rental pool can have its own board of directors and property manager to gather rents, maintain the units, and pay unit expenses. The board of directors for rental pools may vary from the condominium board and directors, although a single property management company could manage both the condos and the rental pool. This is actually preferred by the underwriters. The value of a rental pool is having a single point of contact between the owners and the renters. It is a greater control of rules and regulations. Benefits of being a member of the rental pool is that management costs are usually 1% to 4% cheaper than a single unit management. And since all the units in the rental pool are, are in the same place, they share a set of accounting records in which make it easier to manage and the savings are passed on to the condominium owners. Other returns include administration card charges, shared banking fees, and the advertising of your property for rent. There are also monthly fixed costs in the rental pool that the rental pool pays. These include the condo fees that the rental pool pays on behalf of the owner and management fees if they apply. Other costs may include unit repairs, appliance repairs or replacement, and painting. Condo tells. These differ from true community associations. Condo tells typically share the property with a hotel. A percentage of the condo owners contractually transfer their units into a rental pool program in which the management team or the hotel operator can book on behalf of the condo owners. All unit owners and renters will have access to all the hotel amenities. They will also have a central lobby check-in. An association should have good risk transfer and details of who is responsible for what specific areas on the property with the hotel or the management team. Common areas and pools are typically shown in the contract. Reservations may be done online through a reservation system or direct with the hotel management team. Airbnb is becoming more common, but the majority of the property will still need to be on a global booking reservation, reservation system. Timeshares. Timeshares are now considered more of a hospitality exposure due to the nature of the vacation ownership. Timeshares are properties with a divided form of ownership or use of rights. These properties are typically resort condominium units in which multiple parties hold rights to the property and each owner of the same accommodation is allowed at their period of time. Timeshares do not have permanent residence. Members of the timeshare program typically have a link to reserve their time at the condominium. Timeshares may or may not have a front lobby desk. Then we look at oceanfront versus non-oceanfront properties. What is the underwriter impacting? Oceanfront condos specific to Hawaii typically offer water sports activities. Most of this will have a vendor on site. The association should have a good contract in place with these vendors, including additional insured as they are operating on the insured's premises. Any water sports activities are recommended that the vendor carry a minimum of 5 million in liability limits. Note, the underwriters will review your website. Your advertising your activities on your website is a liability link, even if it's third party operated. Depending on the type of activities offered, the carriers may see this more of a hospitality risk than a condominium risk. Non-oceanfront typically do, have, do not have these activities and can truly be written as a condominium association exposure. Next slide. Underwriting information needed. As previously mentioned, please be as detailed as you can on the risk. We are here to help you to find you the best solution and the best placement for your risk. 
Most carriers standard submission are an Accord 125, a full completed SOV with COPE exposures, construction, occupancy protection, and the exposures happening at the premises. This includes a pretty detail of fire life safety information. Typically on fire life safety, when you're dealing with high rises or buildings over eight stories, all buildings eight to 20 stories must be fully sprinklered or equipped with a standpipe system and a building wide fire alarm. Any building over 20 stories must be fully sprinklered. A full supplemental application Many carriers or, program or programs are very specific in their supplementals and will not accept the competitor supplemental. So be prepared to complete several if you're out to market. Please share the expiring umbrella premiums and limits. Is the incumbent offering renewal? Are they offering the same limits and terms? This specifically helps out with competitors and or risk purchasing groups help build that excess tower layering for you. Understand the renewal target premiums. Do not expect a flat. Rates will be increasing. We do in an excess umbrella, all the GL quotes are considered and part of the renewal process and will need to be seen. Next slide. Five year currently valued loss runs. Some of the carriers may even ask up to 10. So make sure that you understand what those losses are. Explain any claims over 100,000 with corrective measures. Uh, carriers are focusing very, very hard on what we call Marsha claims. These are murders, assaults, rapes, sexual assaults, shootings, stabbings, drugs, more now in the hospitality market, human trafficking, drownings, electrical shock, and even more so now, discrimination claims are being reviewed by the underwriters and the carriers. Mold, lead, fungus, or legionella are also a key. Fatality, paralysis, or brain injury as well. Understand what your quote need by date is, and with the intense underwriting review on the umbrella side, expect at least a minimum of two weeks once the full submission has been submitted. Don't wait to send in your umbrella as you previously have in the past after the GL. It should be sent in 90 days in advance or when the underlying is being submitted as well. Next slide. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, COVID has been having an impact on the industry and is impacting rates indirectly right now. Um, we're not sure what the full effect of it's gonna be. Um, that we don't know how many lawsuits are gonna be filed based on COVID claims. We know that COVID has impacted the the economy. The hardest hit industries have been the hotel, restaurants, and retailers, all of which is a large part of Hawaii's economy. Um, and the associations have been hit as well because they do, some of them do operate as hotels. In this market, we've seen that the business revenues have gone down over the last 15 to 18 months. Expected losses that carriers thought would be coming through the door aren't coming through the door. However, ones that they didn't, didn't anticipate are now showing up. And this is bringing about a whole new realm of lawsuits. Next slide. As I mentioned, there's many different covered lines of business that have been impacted by this. A few of them are business interruption, directors and officers, agency and O, work comp and employment practices. From an association's point of view, you, the DNO could be impacted by you not responding properly. Next slide. So to wrap up the last few minutes that we've spent with you, we wanted to just kind of highlight some of the, or point out some of the highlights. We talked about how the umbrella market continues to change involve, and evolve, whether it's limited coverage, revised underwriting guides, or rate changes. We also reviewed being proactive to mitigate potential claims and losses. And then we also given you fair warning is what you can expect during this renewal time. Be prepared for many more questions and much more detail. Get your umbrella submissions in early. And also it's important when you do get your new terms, review it, what, what it is and what it compared to the last year. Note what the changes are because your exposures and your coverage or your um, the amount that you think you have covered could have dramatically changed. And one of the final questions I'd like to leave with you is, are you, is your umbrella a limit, limit adequate for your association? Thank you. 
Okay, excellent. Thank you, Donna, and thank you, Lisa. Now we turn to the DNO markets and what changes are on the horizon due to the COVID-19 and other factors. To speak on the DNO market, we have Alex Montclair. Alex is a business development manager at Kevin Davis Insurance. Alex oversees the underwriting and marketing for the Southeast Territory. And Kevin Davis provides coverage to over 40,000 community associations across the nation. Alex, since our last webinar with you, uh, you know, there's been some significant changes in the state of the DNO market. Uh, what impacts do you see that are ahead for us? Sure, hello everyone. And uh, thank you, Sean, and thank you, Atlas, for allowing me to share a bit about our understanding of the state of the DNO market. So as all of my co-panelists have already stated, the market hasn't improved much since I presented here a year ago. So what is the state of the DNO market in Hawaii? And from our perspective, the market seems to harden and rates are still on the rise due to a couple things social inflation, an increase in exposure serving on a community association board, and challenges to enforce rules. Next slide. So what is social inflation? Uh, social inflation is used by insurers to describe the rising cost of insurance claims caused by social and economic trends resulting in more litigation and larger jury awards. Social inflation has led to the rise of insurance costs across the board, and I'm not just talking about DNO, but every liability policy, general liability to auto and environmental coverage. As a result, limits are being reduced, premiums are increasing, and exclusions are being added, and social inflation is a major factor in this. Next slide. So what's causing social inflation? There are several reasons why social inflation is a problem now. Mistrust of corporations. Many individuals do not trust corporations, i.e. boards, to do the right thing and assume all decisions are being made with hidden motives. This is creating a world where we want to hire an attorney and file a lawsuit first. And to make matters worse, when people serve on a jury and have to decide who to believe, they are increasingly likely to believe the individual over the corporation or board, whether the facts of the case support that or not. Plaintiff attorneys have gotten smarter. They are advertising and marketing their specialty more and more. They also have a sophisticated data analysis system to target the high rewarding clients. They are now using policy limit to force early offers of settlement in certain jurisdictions and the use of emotion to influence juror thinking. Attorneys focus on the heartless corporations or associations to scare the jury into large verdicts by asking questions that put the juror or their family members in the position of the plaintiff and focusing on what a defendant could have done to prevent an incident, which can lead to significant jury awards. Changes in legal environment. There are generational shifts as millennials take over juries and they tend to be concerned with privacy, climate change, and pay disparity, as well as other social and environmental issues. Any lawsuit that touches on these could trigger a very large verdict. Many jurors are also becoming desensitized to large awards. And for insurance companies, it is difficult to predict because these trends are controlled by social issues. We haven't learned how to accurately predict the social climate and how it will affect a claim. Next slide. So uh, a claim comes to mind involving a male resident who kept harassing a female owner, yelling racist and sexist remarks and threatening her. She repeatedly complained to the association. The board failed to act even though it was fully aware of the problem. She sued the association claiming she suffered emotional injury and sought punitive damages. Once the association knew about the incident, it had a duty to intervene. The association acted with reckless disregard of her rights and the board was ordered to purchase her home and pay damages. The total loss was over $1 million. So this individual harassment claim cost the association a lot of money. Next slide. Increase in exposure serving on a community association board and challenges to enforce rules. There's been a fundamental change for individuals serving on community association boards of directors over the past several years, and that their responsibility has become more complex, which has led to an increase in liability, growth in number of claims against them, and larger jury verdicts awarded against them. There are two issues I'm concerned with. The first is how the association must now consider health, safety, and welfare of the association. And the second is rule enforcement based upon questionable authority. Historically, boards have operated as though they were running a business, including budgeting, rule enforcement, and maintenance. However, board members must now not only manage the community, but also must care for the health and safety and welfare of the community in ways they were never part of the governing documents. 
With COVID-19 creating many major concerns for community associations, I believe that this has created a historic increase in responsibility for, by the boards in having to face with a new set of issues without the knowledge and experience to effectively address them. Next slide. A good example of this is Palmetto Place Condominium Association, where it was said that the board of directors deactivated the key fobs of two homeowners who said that they were COVID-19 positive. The condo association without authority to do so used the deactivation as a way to enforce the husband and wife to stay in the condo for two weeks. Then they told a couple that the HOA would call the police if they attempted to exit the building. They are now suing Palmetto Place for false imprisonment, invasion of privacy, negligence, violation of Florida law, and more. The suit says the association set questionable and potentially illegal rules and lack the authority to enforce those rules. Um, looks like we're going through the slides. If you just keep, keep going back a little bit, Sean. Uh, go back one more. Oh no, go forward now. All right, so next slide now. Now we're, now we're, now we're, on, now we're on track. Okay. So uh, whether we are dealing with COVID issues or climate issues like freezing pipes in Texas or wildfires in California, they all affect community associations by increasing the association board members to exposure to loss. This increase creates significant challenges to the board because the association documents may not give them the authority to handle many of these situations. The second concern is the association's responsibility to enforce more complicated rules like harassment, bullying, hate crimes, public and private nuisance. Things like noise and smoke nuisance that are issues board members must address, again, in ways the documents may have never addressed before. The board can no longer have the association to stay on the sidelines and dismiss bullying as a private matter between two people who can't seem to just get along. The problem with issues like racism and harassment is that we want to ignore them and are unsure how to deal with it when a resident harasses others. Some are fearful that the individual will shift his attention and start attacking them. They hope this bad behavior will subside on its own, and it usually just doesn't. And as a failure to properly address these issues head on could lead to serious issues involving libel, slander, discrimination, and harassment. The failure to act on these issues could prove costly. So a great example of this, as it's listed on the screen, is social media. This is becoming a new and vibrant area for those type of claims against community associations. And because most of community associations have no social media policy, they then are really exposed to defamation claims and liability. A San Francisco jury recently has awarded $2 million in damages to a former employee of the HOA because the association allowed its property manager to target the employee on two social media platforms. He continued to harass and bully, claiming that he was a pedophile and drank on the job. And as you can see, the exposure serving on a community association board of directors has changed. In past, the board members are concerned with maintenance works, landscaping, or repairs. Now it's expanded to areas they have never imagined. We're at a point where people live in these communities feel that their perspective is the best or the only one that should ever be considered. They should have the right to use the pool or gym, bring guests and not pay their assessments because they can't use facilities. They seem to believe that because they feel right, it's right, regardless of the governing documents, state laws, or just being a good neighbor. And many of this group has never even read the governing documents or attended a board meeting. This has led to an increase in Fair Housing Act claims based upon the discrimination and harassment by unit owners against unit owners, board members, contractors, property managers, and renters. Due to the feeling being right, we are seeing more claims and awards being paid out. Next slide. So how has loss history impacted premiums? It's no secret that loss history directly impacts premiums. Every single state uh, from a DNO perspective still has a rate increase need, i.e. increased premium. Hawaii is no exception with a five-year loss ratio of over 100%. This means that for every dollar brought in, we pay out and claim a dollar and some change. Uh, the need to increase rates is on par. Most community associations can expect to see a further raise in their premium over the next year or so. Next slide. So has the pandemic put additional uh, pressure on DNR rates? Yes, um, I'm gonna expand a little bit on here. Uh, COVID-19 has created an incredible challenge to community association boards throughout the US. It is now their responsibility to close the pools, gyms and clubs, house, enforce the rules and regulations, and to ensure the community is making sound responsive decisions with the health, safety, and welfare of its residents in mind. And the problem is that COVID-19 has still left many association boards with more unanswered questions than the answered ones. Community associations do have the emergency powers to close common areas. They also may need to close off entire common buildings and units to anyone who's not unit owner or tenant. The problem is that after you close the pools and gyms and informing all members that the reason is to protect their health, that's usually not enough. They constantly battle the boards by questioning their authority to restrict access to the association's common areas. So just a few complaints we've heard over the past year and they're, they're still coming in. 
failure to open pools, gyms, and other common area services, failure to have full and unrestricted access to facilities, for example, elevators, parking lots, and staircases, failure to allow an essential guest from entering the association property, failure to allow a vendor who has a current contract with the association or the property, and failure to allow short-term leasing, claim filed for assessment reduction for loss of services, and wrongful foreclosure of delinquent assessments. Next slide. So I get this question often with everything I just said, are we gonna be seeing any additional DNO exclusions? Um, from our perspective at Travelers, uh, Kevin Davis, no new exclusions on our end. You're just gonna to continue to see that strict, tough underwriting that all of my uh, co-panelists have mentioned. So Sean, I think that wraps up uh, my presentation. All right, thank you, Alex. And I apologize. I, there were so many questions coming in, I accidentally scrolled through the questions and advanced the slides by accident. No worries, no worries, thanks, Sean. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much. Now let's turn to the strategies to assist the AOEOs. In the last segment, I will share a how-to list of proactive strategies that you can implement. So let's get started. So in the hardening market strategies, with this, with this market, um, it is important to strategize with your insurance agent. Budget accordingly for the next year, as early as a year in advance, because uh, you want to work with your insurance agent on what types of premium increases that your AOL, AOL can expect. The second thing, uh, as we heard earlier, is uh, insurance premiums will be going up for those clients in the non-admitted or the excess and surplus markets. For clients in the admitted or standard markets, the increases may be a little lower based on the claims history. And you'll also wanna have some uh, discussion with your insurance agent on which companies will be app uh, approached for quotes. Ron Sukumaki earlier had mentioned and uh, he gave us an overview on the underwriting appetites for the different insurance companies and what they're uh, willing to insure. Uh, next, Alex Montclair said, underwriting guidelines are getting stricter. So with this, you want your partner, uh, you wanna partner with your agent to understand not only the insurance marketplace, but also an agent who will take the time to get to know your AOL and your property so they can make the proper recommendations. You also need to know, uh, have an agent uh, who can help you explore the other alternatives, including having access to all the variable markets out there. And this is to keep the premiums affordable for you. And finally, explore with your agent uh, the must have coverages versus the nice to have coverages. All right, uh, let's next turn, excuse me, let's next turn to the review of the AOL losses and claims with your insurance. Now, um, for most insurance companies, a favorable loss ratio claims is roughly about 30% or less. And simply speaking, uh, if you have a premium of 30,000, you want a, your claims uh, to be below 9,000 or below 30%. Number two, you wanna have your agent's loss control team assess your risks. They can help minimize your risks and claims frequencies. And the third, and we have three points in that, is communicate with the AO, AO's proactive mitigation efforts to prevent future claims uh, to your agent and your underwriter. You'll also wanna review the severity of the claims or how long the, um, oh, <clears throat> how big, excuse me, how big or how long uh, the expenses uh, have been. And typically underwriters are looking at three items. Number one, the loss ratio from the last three to five years. Number two, the frequency and severity of these claims. And number three, how often and why those losses have happened. Now turning to inspection, and inspections and maintenance, um, do not defer maintenance costs or do not defer any maintenance. Uh, if you do, you're hoping that nothing bad will happen. So what are the types of property maintenance that underwriters are looking for? Well, first we recommend high risk component inspections to be done on common area elements and inside every single unit every three years. Regular inspection and maintenance of vertical stacks or main plumbing lines and connections will be another way to prevent those losses. We you wanna keep good records um, for updates to the roof, the electrical and the plumbing because underwriters will be asking about this and this will protect your insurability and try to get you the best rate. And next, be prepared for inspections by the insurance companies with stricter guidelines inspections are now required from the property insurers who wanna see that all your AOLs are well-maintained. Liability insurance wanna make sure that there are no hazardous conditions on your property that could cause bodily injury or property damage. 
And now we turn to the safety systems and emergency responses. We recommend that AOAO staff and board members are properly trained on what to do during an emergency or a loss. For water emergencies, consider water leak detectors and, uh, and this is to prevent losses. To, to prevent uh, claim severity, AOAO staff will need to be trained on where the water shutoff valves are and how to turn them off. The AOAO staff or property manager will also need to instruct or help unit owners involved in a water loss to call the re remediation company right away and prevent uh, any damage from spreading. With water damage, we are trying to prevent the growth of mold because most insure, insurance policies have mold sublimits on how much they will pay for removing or treating mold. For fire emergencies, insurance, <clears throat> excuse me, insurers require safety systems like smoke detectors, fire extinguishers, and some of the insurers, insurers like First Insurance and Fireman's Fund are also being more selective with new accounts and will not be insuring AOAO high-rise buildings that do not have fire sprinklers if they are not already on the account. Now to prevent fire, uh, severe fire losses, AOAO staff will need to be trained on where and how safety, how to safely use the fire extinguishers and how property respond to the fire or smoke alarm notification systems. A practical fire ev evacuation plan will also need to be put in place to make sure lives are not put in danger. Also be able to call 911 as soon as practical and to call the remediation company as soon as the situation is stable to prevent damage from spreading. And finally, we go to the hardening market strategies. Now, two of the most important things to keep in mind is one, having annual board trainings and how to prevent li liability and DNO claims. Having board members sign an annual acknowledgement stating that they understand their governing documents, bylaws, and house rules, and will be making decisions fairly in accordance to those rules. Now, due to claims made nature of the DNO policies, it is, it is one policy that we do not want to see removed or non-renewed. A claims made policy has a lot of time constraints. So on a claims made policy, a claim that is made against the AOL directors and officers will be covered by the policy in place at the time the demand or the suit is served. For claims to be covered, the occurrence or the incident that caused the suit would need to happen after the retroactive date and also known as a prior or pending litigation date. This is usually the policy inception date or the very first day when the DNO policy was written with that particular insurance company. Two important takeaways for your umbrella coverages are number one, understand the terms and conditions of the umbrella that you're purchasing and, number, uh, and does it follow uh, the underlying form or not? And number two, understand the liability exposures to be proactive in minimizing your risks. Okay, let's finally turn to the Q&A. Uh, can all of our panelists turn their videos on? And I can go through the Q&A. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, let's turn to the first question, um, Jim and Heather. The first question, what can we expect regarding pricing if we are forced out of the standard market and into surplus and excess markets? Looks like Heather's staying on mute, so I'll go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we talked about, we touched on it a little bit and it's kind of, it's a, a lot of variables in there. Um, but uh, we're also seeing a lot of that happen. And I think part of the problem is that the only thing that people have to go on uh, as far as estimating where they're at price wise is what they paid last year. And when that market goes away, suddenly you're thrust out and, and, in, in those cases, you could be, you know, we've seen a lot of instances where it's two times, three times, 300%. Uh, that's not AOAO business in Hawaii, but that's certainly a hard market reality in other places. Uh, I would say probably a, a, a guide, if you were going from a standard market into the ENS and you were forced to layer a lot of uh, limits and capacity, you'd probably easily be looking at 40, 50% increase in in rate and premium. Okay, any comments, Heather? 
No, I would agree. I mean, I think it depends if there's losses and, um, you know, the, the, the risk itself. I mean, if it was, if it was non-renewed due to losses, we could certainly see more. The, the issue that we have, you know, as Jim mentioned, is layering We're using multiple markets. So if we have to go from, you know, like a single dung boo doing one carrier full limits to, you know, six, eight, 10 carriers, it, it just, it gets up into the two, three, four times of what it was last year pretty quickly, especially if there's losses. Um, just as an example, just to, this, this isn't Hawaii, but um, I just did a wildfire account that was single carrier, you know, full limits of like 150 million. And we were only able to find part of that capacity and took 14 carriers and it was five or six times the premium. So different, different, that's pretty extreme, but that's kind of the, the worst of the worst. So I think it's probably, happens. it's probably worth pointing out that you, you're not always in control of this. It, it could be loss, loss experience, but it could be some total uh, unexpected change in the carrier's appetite that you're with that they choose to exit um, the market. They choose not to write AOAO if they're frame and within 500 feet of the ocean or something. And that, that, oh, that alone would be a reason that you might get thrust out of the admitted market. Okay, thank you. I have another question here. Ron, we're gonna to go to you on this one. Uh, is there any advantage insurance wise uh, to a high rise condo, 14 floors, being a non-smoking building? Well, I guess the short answer is not a lot of advantage. Uh, whether you're smoking or non-smoking, the underwriters really look at the fire protection in that building. That's going to drive it. Uh, do they have adequate smoke detectors? Do they have adequate uh, fire extinguishers? Do they have stand pipes? Do they have sprinkler systems? Uh, those are the key factors in underwriters looking at a building, whether it's a smoke-free environment versus a, uh, you know, uh, a smoking uh, environment. Uh, Maybe uh, Jim is in the ENS market, but the local carriers certainly don't have credits for that particular exposure. Probably important to distinguish that, uh, that the, the risk of fire is only one small piece of the premium, particularly in Hawaii, and that uh, a smoking policy would, even if that were the case, even if you uh, uh, could show that you were going to have better loss experience because of that. It's only a, a small credit to a smaller portion of the premium. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We have another question, Ron. Uh, we're going to go to you again on this one. How do you know if your agent has access to all the competitive markets and how often do you recommend your agent survey the property or project? So a two-part question uh, from the same person. Well, how do you know? Well, I guess the uh, short answer is you need to ask your agent. The, if they're in the business, they should know whether they have access to the, you know, as I pointed out, there's a very limited marketplace. So you could pretty much you know, ask them uh, if you're a high rise, uh, do you have access to all the, all three markets or basically all, all the standard markets. Uh, it, you know, it's so limited. Uh, now the, the other question was how often should you market or how often should, how often do you recommend an agent survey the property or project? Oh, um, well, probably, uh, every three to five years. And a lot depends upon the property. If they're making a lot of changes and stuff. We have a couple of properties that are going through total uh, remodeling. Uh, they're doing spalding work. Uh, they're repainting. They're doing uh, work on the railings and stuff. We would probably say you should do inspect those a little more often because truthfully, I'd like to go out after they do all that work and take more pictures because it gives a better a portrait of that client to underwriters. So uh, certainly uh, the ones that are 
going through a lot of changes, certainly you're going to need to go out more often. Okay, thank you. Great question. Uh, let's go to Lisa and Donna next. Uh, is the property considered oceanfront if it does not have direct access and out of a tsunami zone? Um, <clears throat> typically not. It wouldn't be considered ocean. Um, again, in, in an umbrella liability access market, the underwriters are going to be reviewing the website. If the website has any type of water sports activities or has a, you know, a surf or a paddleboard vendor on site, that's really what's going to kick it to that ocean side. I mean, we, we insure a one condo that has, you know, a street in between them and the ocean, but they can, they can still get their paddle boards and walk across the street to the ocean and, and use the paddle boards in a rental pur purpose. So it really kind of just depends. Um, but I would say to answer that specific question, no, wouldn't be considered ocean. Okay, thank you. Alex, you have the next question. We're gonna to go to you. Have you seen an incident when an AOL director is accused of bullying an employee? And the second part of that question is, what is the liability, I'm sorry, what, yeah, what, what is liability of the entire AOL for this type of behavior? Sure, absolutely. So um, we, uh, as you mentioned, we insure a, a lot of associations across country. So we see, you know, the gambit of claims. And we have seen this claim, you know, several times, unfortunately. Um, I wouldn't say there's an epidemic of, unfortunately, of, of directors or board members um, bullying employees, but it does come up sometimes. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's really, it, it's wrongful infliction of emotional distress is what it's going to come down to. And you're going to want to make sure that you have some type of uh, employment practice liability, EPLI uh, coverage, you know, um, on the book. So, you know, definitely contact your agent and make sure you do have some type of coverage to, to make sure that, you know, that, that you are covered in case that does happen. Okay, great. Thank you. And I have another question for you, Alex. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds like, Alex, you're saying that a person can enter an elevator without a mask, or is that what you are saying? You know, this is from your earlier presentation, I'm assuming. Yeah, I don't remember saying it, but I'm sorry if it, if it came up across that way. Um, I'm not saying that. I, I'm, I, I'm definitely saying, A, you should always uh, look at your governing documents, make sure if they don't say anything a lot of times, because COVID came with such a surprise that many governing documents didn't have anything to address the epidemic, but you should look at them, contact an attorney, contact an agent. And when you make rules, um, you know, follow state, local, and federal guidelines. That's probably the best answer I can give you. Okay, thank you. We're going to go back to Jim and Heather. Uh, I have a question here. What property lines of insurance are the most difficult to place? Uh, earthquake, flood, business, interruption, and what kinds of increases are you seeing? Jim or Heather? Sorry, Jim, you're on mute. He's on mute. It, <laughs> I think that one's kind of situational as well. Um, you know, if we're in Hilo, Blood and quake is much more difficult than blood and quake in, uh, in Oahu, I would say, depending on, again, the zones and that kind of stuff. So I, I think it's situational would be my generic answer. Okay. Jim. Yeah. Um, we see a wide variety of uh, frame on the beach, uh, certainly going to be uh, a, a different sort of marketplace. Um, and, and, the, and the most difficult in our market. Um, large limits also going to, uh, just because of the cost of capacity, the cost to build all the limits, anything over 100 million is also going to uh, be a, li a little bit more difficult in today's market. Again, back to the admitted versus non admitted uh, scenario. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ron, we're going to go to you on this one. Should a condo, a condo, condo tell? allow a building to be smoking, especially if residents have asthma? <laughs> well, there's somewhat of a uh, slide over on the DNO side. Should they uh, allow that? Uh, it A lot has to do with the building rules. Uh, if it's 
if you have a non-smoking building, obviously it's up to the directors and officers or the board members to be sure that they enforce the rules. Now, if the rules are not there, uh, the directors and officers still have an obligation to allow uh, peaceful usage of the unit. So if you have a unit owner that has asthma uh, and they can't use their unit well because the neighbor smokes or something, I think then they have to try to see what they could do to uh, prevent smoking uh, next door or whatever. Uh, so it, you know, it's just a matter of uh, the association directors and officers have somewhat of an obligation for quiet usage or rightful usage of each of the unit owners. And if some of the things like smoking affects that, then, you know, they have an obligation to try to see what they can do to fix that. Okay. I can tell you on a liability standpoint too, specific to condo tells because they are typically hook to a hotel is that 90% of all hotels do not allow smoking on premises or they have a designated spot. And so when they rent those units out on behalf of the condo unit owner, those rules are definitely also provided on the hotel's website as well. Thank you. We'll go to Donna and Lisa on this one for the umbrella. Uh, for high-rise AOAOs that do not have fire sprinklers but pass the, city, the Honolulu City and County fire and safety inspection because of other safety features in the building, will these AOAOs have a chance to be insurable again under your umbrella program or the other standard AOAO umbrella programs? I can speak to our program um, in which we do have a series of about 10 carriers involved within our programs that they have pretty strict uh, fire life safety guidelines in respects to high rises. Now, as I mentioned in my, in my previous slide, an eight to 20 story. So that's a pretty broad range. Um, if they're not sprinklered, we require stand pipes and a building wide alarm. So they don't have to be sprinklered, but they do have to have standpipes and a building wide alarm. If they're over 20 stories, it would be rejected in our program if it's not 100% sprinklered. Um, and this, this not is only, you know, within Hawaii, because a lot of the older cities, you know, LA, Chicago, New York, Boston, they all have big high rises of 40 stories that aren't sprinklered. So we do kind of take those into consideration if they've got some uh, exposure there. The biggest part of why they're not handled on an umbrella liability side is that people are sleeping. They're asleep. You don't smell the smoke. You don't wake up to an alarm. You don't have time to get out of the building. And so that's why it is really important to make sure that either you have a standpipe to at least protect the stairwells. So you're at least safe once you close those fire doors and the stairwells and get out of that building. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Next question we have uh, goes to Alex. Alex, what is the state of the AOL DNO market and is Hawaii treated differently than the mainland? Right, so um, as, we, as we've all been talking, this, the state of the market is, is, is rough, right? To, to put it softly and, and short. Um, but you know, it's, it's not alone as in the rest of the United States, you guys aren't singled out. If you look at Southern California, New York and Southeast Florida, they're a little bit behind you guys in the, the perilous charge of rate increase, but they're right there as well. I mean, we have very tough underwriting with them. We don't make any exemptions. So you guys aren't alone. The market's tough, but, um, you know, you'll get through it with, uh, with Atlas. So that's all I got to say about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Ron, we have a question for you. Uh, would the reserve study help as well? Well, the reserve study is really a study of, uh, making sure that they have adequate money to do the repairs. And uh, as we talked about, uh, certainly uh, the reserve studies could help to show an underwriter that we're going to redo this roof 
in two years, or we're going to be replumbing in a certain amount of time to at least let the underwriters know that you are planning and you will be doing the repairs within a certain amount of time. Uh, at least it shows that in the reserve studies uh, that have certain elements to them. But, uh, you know, for those who need it now, it no, but it certainly can help show that a uh, association is accumulating the funds to do this and we'll have it, we'll start next year or something pretty immediate type of thing. So yes, it can help. Okay, thank you. Next question uh, for Lisa and Donna. Does your, spring, does your surplus umbrella market allow for buildings that are non-sprinklered or is this a requirement for all your programs? That, well, again, kind of just going back to what I touched based on, because we, we are dealing with liability. And by the way, we're not surplus. We actually are admitted in most all of our markets. Yeah. Um, and, and so, but again, it just goes back to liability. You're sleeping. You need an alarm to wake you up and get out of the building. If it's eight to 20 stories, standpipe system with a building alarm is satisfactory within our program. Anything over 20, it does have to be 100% sprinkler. Okay, thank you. Next question for Ron or Alex. Is it wise to have a, a Hawaiian director on the board such that he or she can respond more quickly than a mainland director to any of the concerns? So I guess location. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I'll, 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 maybe Ron, you can shed some light on that a little bit more, but I'll just say that um, you, you brought up a good point. Communication um, is absolutely key in um, mitigating any uh, claim before it happens. Um, you know, association members do not like their residents, don't like to be surprised by something. So um, if you have somebody who has consistent communication and can answer stuff quick, it can sort of stop them away from the idea that, man, I need to get an attorney, I'm getting upset. I'm sitting here in my, you know, um, my unit thinking about how I'm gonna sue this person if, versus getting a, you know, a uh, answer quicker. So, I mean, there is an, sort of an expect that, you know, expect some lag time between getting an answer. Um, so if you want that answer immediately and you got somebody in California and there might be some lag time, it all depends. But Ron, I don't know if you feel the same way. You have somebody well, from home. <laughs> well, certainly I do feel pretty much it. It is better to have a certain amount of the directors and officers. But as we found, most of our uh, boards have a, a lot of the board members are on the mainland. And with the communication systems nowadays, uh, you know, we are seeing a ton more Zoom meetings just like this, uh, where people can uh, communicate uh, more rapidly, I guess, and address the issues. So I, yeah, it, it's obviously better have somebody boots on the ground right there, but it depends upon uh, how the associations are set up for good communications, which is the key. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. We're just going to take one more last question here because we're just about uh, time's up. Uh, this is just for the, I guess the group, not really for the group, but maybe Ron or, or Heather or someone can answer this one. Is the roof condition and data important to underwriters for property renewals? Well, the short answer is absolutely. Uh, you know, when I, I guess it's the old loss control part of me. I, that's how I started in this business. But, you know, the first thing I do when I look at a building is I, I like to go up on the roof of a high rise and I like to look at, well, it's a great view obviously around so I can look at the exposures easily, but I also check for roofs, uh, the roof condition uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it just sort of gives me a insight in terms of how well is this building being maintained? Uh, you know, uh, uh, associations, if they've put deferred maintenance and stuff like that, and the roof is not very good condition, I can tell you that it just tells a story in itself. So we're supposed to represent the associations. So obviously I'm not gonna bring that up to the carriers, but it tells me a lot about it. And it's something that, you know, 
the underwriters are going to ask that question anyway. When was the roof last updated? It's a question in almost all the applications. So, yeah, roof condition is very important. Great. Heather, Jim, you have anything to say about that? Any more, any more comments? In our marketplace, you would uh, typically see uh, an ACV, actual cash value limitation, if it's anything older than 10 or 15 years. Uh, we frequently have to talk carriers through that. It's a, it's a big mainland issue uh, that because of hail and, and so forth. So we're always uh, convincing underwriters that it's not as big a problem in Hawaii as, as other places, but it's, it's a reality. Okay, great, thank you. All right. I would all, uh, Sean, I would also yeah. add to that on a liability yep. sense, we ask for the same thing both in a general liability and an excess for properties that are older than 1995. Um, and again, it goes back to what Ron and Jimbo said, it shows a maintenance uh, commitment from the owners. Okay, thank you. All right, well, now that we've come to the end, uh, you may ask yourself, what can we do to prepare for the hard market now? Well, the first step is to getting a free comprehensive coverage review from my AOEO team. Uh, we can also provide our audience today with a high risk component checklist. Uh, and this will be helpful in managing your AOALs. And finally, on behalf of Atlas Agency, I wanna thank all of our speakers on their insights. Jim Sipich and Heather Dugan from CRC Group, Donna Percival and Lisa Rogers from the Distinguished Programs, Alex Montclair from Kevin Davis and our own Ron Sukamaki from Atlas Insurance. It looks like we got through all the questions, so I'm excited. Uh, to touch basis with you. If you have any more that you can uh, email me, uh, our, our information is, or my information is on the bottom. Um, registered in attendees will receive a copy of this recorded webinar. I wanna thank everyone for attending. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be with us and aloha. Aloha.